Chris, Deng Chu, Cheng San, choir, and everyone gathered here, thank you for having me. Taluk Ayer has always been special. Thank you. It holds a special place in my heart as you have always been such a strong support to us at MSM. I bring warm greetings from the Methodist School of Music. Our boss, Clarissa, is doing a wonderful job guiding us in new and exciting direction. We ask for your prayers as we continue to serve the Methodist Church in Singapore and beyond. Thank you once again for your kindness and partnership. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the beautiful gift of music that fills our hearts with joy and lifts our spirits in worship. As we gather to learn more about music and worship and how these shape our daily lives, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, illuminate our minds, our hearts through your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Today, we are diving into the theme of true worship, singing, loving, and living and loving. Worship is more than just a collection of songs. It's an expression of our relationship with God and with each other. Music is multifaceted. It moves our hearts, connects us with others, and calls us to action. Today, we'll explore how music functions not only as a form of praise, but as a way to embody and live out our faith through singing to God, living out his teachings and loving our neighbors in all we do. At KKMC, where I worship, Kampong Kapur Methodist Church, we had a choir retreat on September 22. We gathered in groups of three for conversation. I was asked, how did you become a church musician? I wondered too. Taking piano lessons wasn't common during my school years, but my mother heard about a piano teacher and that's when I began my lessons in secondary three. Little did I know that those simple piano lessons would lead me to my first experience playing for worship on Sundays on a small old organ that had four octaves and required pumping the pedals to produce sound. This journey had led me to a deeper understanding of worship and worship leadership. We give thanks to God for the gift of music among the many blessings he had bestowed on us. I attended an Anglican mission school where, we, where weekly chapel services were part of the routine. That early exposure to worship shaped me in ways I didn't fully understand at the time. After finishing my university degree, I wanted to go back to school so that I could finish my other major, but my mother reminded me of my family's needs and said no. On hindsight, I see that God had a different plan. One Sunday, I happened to meet two seminarian interns who mentioned a scholarship opportunity at the Asian Institute for Liturgy and Music in Manila. I thought, why not? I applied. To my surprise, I passed. Only four were going to be taken in. But when I arrived in Manila, entered the orientation session, I discovered that all 20 of us who applied had been accepted. The institute was located on the seminary campus where we were deeply immersed in music and worship. We attended evening prayers regularly and I was also rostered to play for some of the weekly services. 
At the Institute, we had Wednesday worship where students from different countries introduced new compositions for worship. It became a time of learning, not just about music, but about how worship is expressed across cultures. At AILM, Dr. Lim Sui Hong, who was from Wesley Methodist Church, Singapore, was my senior. He returned to Singapore after school, and after some years, he left again for the US to pursue his master's and later his doctorate. He encouraged me to further my studies. In 2003, I received a scholarship to study at Perkins School of Theology, the same school where Dr. Lily Wong earned her doctorate. I went with a plan to finish my studies and return to serve at the seminary in Manila. In 2005, four months before graduation, I attended a gathering of Methodist musicians at Perkins. There, Dr. Lim Sui Hong also attended, and he encouraged me to join the Methodist School of Music in Singapore. That conversation marked the beginning of my journey with MSM. Although it had never crossed my mind to work outside of the Philippines, looking back, I see that every step was part of God's plan. I didn't always know what was next, but in obedience, I followed the doors God had opened, trusting that he would lead me to where I was meant to be. And through it all, the constant undercurrent was music, God's gift, and the way he has used me to serve his church. Looking back, I can see how music has always was always at the center of my journey, drawing me into worship, not just through singing, but through leaving out my faith. This journey had led me to a deeper understanding of worship and worship leadership. We give thanks to God for the gift of music among the many blessings he has bestowed on us. He's also given us the wisdom to explore and enjoy its richness in so many forms. If we were to take a poll on what type of music brings us together in worship, I'm sure many of us would say our songs of, yeah, songs of praise, I heard you. Let me ask you a question. How are you doing today? I ask because one way we practice worship is expressing how we feel. How do we listen to these expressions? How do we respond? And what do we do to, to what we feel or what we sing about? Worship isn't just about the songs we sing. It's also about how we live our lives outside these walls. Let me ask you, how are you today? How is your worship life? And if you could answer with a song, what would that song be? If you ask me, Judith, how are you? While writing this sermon, when I reached this part and asked myself, how are you? Before I could even sing a song about how I felt, it was as if the Lord jumped in and sang to me instead. Stand, oh, stand firm. Stand, oh, stand firm. Stand, oh, stand firm and see what the Lord can do. Maybe you can sing with me. Stand, oh, stand firm. Stand, oh, stand firm. Stand, oh, stand firm and see what the Lord can do. Moments like this remind me of how singing doesn't just express our personal experience, but draws us together in worship. When we think about music's role in worship, it is clear that it adds something truly special it helps create a sense of reverence, joy, and a deep connection with God. The act of singing within the liturgy carries a profound purpose 
resonating deeply with us as worshipers. However, music's impact goes even further than what we feel right away. When it comes to our spiritual growth, music has a powerful effect. Imagine music as a transformative tool. When we sing together, we are absorbing the heart of our faith. This shapes how we think, what we care about, and the kind of people we become. Music can touch our feelings and spirit, helping us grow spiritually and feel even closer to the divine. That's why picking the right songs is important. It is like making thoughtful decision that directly affects everyone in the congregation. Our well-being is connected to this choice. A common scripture we turn to when talking about music is Ephesians 5. Together, let us read. Speak to each other in psalms and spiritual songs, making to the Lord always giving thanks. The psalms alone, all 150 of them are rich for exploration. The psalms cover every human experience, joy, sorrow, gratitude, anger, doubt, and hope. They teach us that it is okay to bring all of our feelings to God, encouraging authenticity in our relationship with him. The psalmists teach us to be honest with our feelings. The Psalms invite us to bring the fullness of our human experience before God, our joy, our struggles, our questions, our gratitude. In worship, they serve as a guide, helping us to express all aspects of life and faith in ways that are honest and deeply personal. The hymns do play a significant role. Rooted in history, they connect us to generations of worshipers who have sang the same words, making them a shared expression of faith across time. Hymns teach us theology, shaping our understanding of who God is and reminding us of the church's communal journey, shaping communal journey through love, struggle, and growth. Together, Psalms and hymns give depth and richness to our worship, inviting us to experience and live out God's truth as a community. So as we speak to one another, we might say like this, I love the way you sing. I am so sorry for hurting your feelings. Lord, help those in need. Why, O oh Lord, do people suffer? Thank you, God, for all your blessings. A whole spectrum of songs help us express what we feel. Historically, the psalms were sung in community, creating a shared expression of faith, lament, and worship. By singing them today, we connect generations who have used these words to seek God. These were songs, these were their songs. In the same way, it's okay for us to sing songs that express our deepest emotions and be real with the Lord. The Lord, our maker, deliverer, comforter, provider, and defender. Wherever we are in life, we can find God there. The Psalms often are a dialogue not just praise, but conversations that sometimes question God and express frustration or impatience. They encourage us to come to God honestly, even with our struggles. Some Psalms are prophetic and foreshadow Christ's offering a glimpse of God's redemption plan. Many Psalms invite us to Selah, a term 
meaning to pause and reflect, reminding us that worship is also about contemplation and listening. Silence should be intentional so that the congregation will not feel uneasy and wonder, what's next? Who's next? What's going on? At MSM, we seek to mentor the next generation. Children in Worship is a program that aims to nurture children to be, faith, to be worshipful and develop their voices and hands to serve God through music. Worshipful worship isn't just singing. It is expressing our hearts sincerely to God and loving others through our actions. We guide the children in this language of the Psalms. Be thankful, take responsibility, say sorry, give praise, pray for the family and friends and those in need. And yes, do not hesitate to ask God why. I asked the children, what are you sorry for? One said, I'm so sorry I hit my brother. Another said, I'm sorry for my sins. But the response of another child surprised me. He said, no, Jesus has taken all our sins. I had to explain that we do continue to sin. That is why we ought to say sorry and ask God to help us stop sinning. Then I asked, what why question would you ask God? Ezra asked, why is there war? Another said, why are some children poor? When I asked, what are you thankful for? Michaela, a five-year-old who cannot even read well yet, replied, I'm thankful for eternal life. Whoa. Where did she hear that? She's certainly getting some good stuff. The children learned that they can write all kinds of songs. A sorry song, a thank you song, a why song, a please song, please meaning we pray for others. We gave them short passages from the Psalms and they set them to music. Now let's talk about the hymns. There's always so much controversy surrounding them. Some say they're old fashioned and that the youth don't like them. Is it how we are singing them? Well, they can be contemporized just as we did this, morning, this afternoon if we have to. I often hear a common concern, children don't know the hymns. But why is that? Because we don't teach them. And sometimes we say that the youth are leaving the church because the music doesn't meet their preference. Many argue that hymns are essential because they teach us theology, grounding us in the truths of our faith. Sure, the language of the hymns can feel too chim, too deep, too complex, but that's the beauty of it. The complexity reflects how chim, how deep, and how profound our Lord God is. The closer we get to God, the more we want and need to know him. I am not saying that God pulls away as we seek him. Rather, his greatness is beyond our comprehension. Hymn writers are so gifted that they give us food for our souls that may be hard to chew, but it is essential for our spiritual growth. How deep do we want to go in knowing who God is? The Psalms speak of an all-encompassing God, and just like the Psalms, hymns shape our understanding of God and what it means to live out our faith. Hymns aren't just about learning theology. They remind us of how to live. And to express these truths in our actions and relationships within the church and beyond. When we sing of God's holiness, his justice, or his love, these songs shape how we see ourselves and each other, calling us to live lives that, re that reflect 
what we sing. What kind of hymns do we sing? What are we singing about? Why did Paul encourage us to speak to each other with these types of music? If we look at the preceding text, it says, so take special care of how you conduct yourselves. Paul is guiding us to live wisely, making the most of every opportunity and encouraging one another through the music we share. Charles Wesley left us with 6,000 hymns, yet out of those, we often only sing a small handful. Oh, for a thousand and can it be love divine, come the long expect, and maybe 20 more, not even a hundred. And every time we celebrate Aldous Gate or ordination, we go back, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. I can almost imagine Wesley up there saying, hello, I have 5,585 more songs, la. <laughs> but beyond the 6,000 hymns, Wesley teaches us about social holiness. And social holiness is exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us, loving God and loving our neighbor. That's what Paul is saying. In verse 16, he writes, Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. It's exactly what Jesus has been teaching us all along. What John and Charles Wesley have taught and what our bishop has been saying for the past four years, love God, love your neighbor. On the weekend of September 27 and September 28, we had our worship symposium focused on intergenerational worship. Music emerged as a subject with the potential to either unite or divide generations. When generations make music together, something special happens, a blending of voices that represents our community. But what are we singing about? Are we singing what the boomers want? Are we singing what the Gen Z wants? Or maybe what the Gen X wants? We reflect on the songs we learned as children, songs that taught us who God is, like Jesus loves the little children, all things bright and beautiful. Are these songs still part of our shared experience so that each generation continues to sing to the same God who teaches us to love him and each other. The question becomes, what are we truly singing about? Each song we sing in worship tells a story or engages in dialogue. Some songs remind us of God's story, others of his promises, and others are an expression between us and God or among ourselves as a community. So how do we reflect on singing, living, and loving in practice? This is where music becomes more than a melody. It becomes action and connection. By singing songs that tell us of God's love, we are called to live lives that reflect that love, reaching out in compassion and understanding across generations. Singing is not just an activity. It is a shared experience that reminds us to live out God's story in our own lives. In this way, true worship is both personal and communal. It unites us across ages and backgrounds, calling us to embody what we sing, to live out our worship we love as God loves, as God loves us, letting our shared songs inspire our actions beyond these walls. We need to sing songs to God. Oops. Songs about who he is, his faithfulness, and his teachings. But we also need to sing to each other about what God calls us to do. The songs we choose, the hymns and choruses we repeat, shape our understanding of God and our values as a community. How many of our songs focus on loving God? Maybe 500? 
And how many talk about loving our neighbor? Maybe 10? I might be exaggerating, but the question remains, what is our song diet? This diet, what we sing and how often, matters because it impacts our lives. It's easy to sing about love for God. But what? But are we also singing about his call to love our neighbors, care for the needy, and seek justice? Our songs should remind us not only of who God is, but also of who he calls us to be. What does our song diet look like? Can it look like this? This brings us to the prophet Amos. Prophet Amos says, together, let's read. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice rule. Amos reminds us that true worship without justice is empty. True worship isn't just about the songs we sing in church, but how we live our lives, how we treat others, and how we bring justice into our everyday actions. It's about how we live our lives and love our neighbors. We do not live in isolation. Worship and song are not isolated to our Sunday and within itself. Every day we interact with each other and with others. We wake up with our families, we go to work, we meet strangers, we buy from the hawker or the grocer, we go to the gas station, and then we turn home to our families. The cycle repeats, and then we come back. PA2 Sanctuary, 1.30 in the afternoon. Here to this sanctuary to start a new week. Be energized and know that God is with us through the week. What do we do from here, and why is it important to recognize this and keep doing it? What may cause somebody to sing, God is so good? Or what can lead a community to lament and sing, why, oh Lord, did this have to happen? We make decisions big and small, and every decision affects those around us. And these decisions are influenced or triggered by love for others, sense of justice, sense of community. What Amos is saying is that our worship becomes empty if it is not lived out through justice and love in our daily lives. I collaborated with the choir so we could sing this. Can I have an F? You're singing with the choir for this. Yes, yes. Yes. 
School of Music is moving in a different direction and with our vision, life transforming music, we pray that we can make a difference in these challenging times. It is our hope that the curriculum we implement encourage the students to bring their music to communities who need to hear about God's good news. A new program we have is a piano instruction for neurodivergent in individuals. Here is Ashvat, who loves to come on Wednesday afternoon to learn piano and explore the world of music, composing melodies. We also have Harmony Hearts, a children's choir where these neurodivergent children come together with their parents and caregivers to explore music. While these are programs that are developing, we also envision our students going out to play in homes, or inviting children who are less able to study music. We believe that children have the gift of music. We just need to tap into that potential. While some families can afford these lessons, others cannot. So MSM extends support where we can. There are opportunities to support these programs so that we can continue reaching out to these children. Music is not just for our own enjoyment. It has the power to transform lives. In moments of joy, weddings, anniversaries, and promotions, or in sorrow and loss, music connects us and brings peace even in distress. It is life transforming. As a congregation, when we participate in the singing, we encourage and affirm each other with the presence of God who dwells in each of us, calling us to be present to one another. In doing so, we become part of God's work and God's plan. The choir ministers to us, the musicians too, and through our listening, we hear God's word. As the, Spirit, as the Holy Spirit moves among us, we become spirit-filled and inspired to carry out what God has called us to do. When we sing together, we are not just making music, we are declaring our unity in Christ and committing ourselves to live out the love we sing about, both in the sanctuary and out in the world. As we leave today, we are, let us remember that true worship is about singing to the Lord, living lives of justice, and loving our neighbors. Let's commit to following God's call in this way by singing again another hymn. Dream 
Amen. I have concluded that I have a quick postscript. We'd love to invite the children to our children's choir camp, which will culminate in their participation in our Christmas presentation at Wesley Methodist Church. We have postcards with more details which will be handed out to you after the service. Feel free to take one and learn more. Thank you. Church, let us thank God.